Good evening, I'm from Essex, in case you couldn't tell. My given name is Dickie, I come from Billericay, and I'm doing very well. At the love affair with Nina, in the back of my Cortina, a season up hyena, could not have been more obscene. She took me to the cleaners and other misdemeanors, but I got right up between her, rum and her. If candy floss is sticky, hold it, hold it. I ain't a bleeding thicky, I'm Billericky Dicky, and I'm Mark Six. Seven or eight hours old. I was caught in Sandy, to eight to make a randy. So, uh, what brings you down the dogs tonight? Uh, we're working. Um, on um, a charity raising function for Cancer Backup, which is uh, primarily a counselling service, but also advisory and um, an archive. Now, would I be right in saying that you're no stranger to Walthamstow dogs? I've been out with a couple of girls from Walthamstow. <laughs> She looked more like a ganny. She wasn't half a penny. Her mother tried to ban it. Her father helped me plan it. And when I captured Janet, she bruised her puppy granny. Well, you asked Joyce and Vicky. Uh, I got diagnosed about a year and two months ago. And my surgeon, Charles Ackle said, I'm going to put you with a man who's at the cutting edge of oncology or cancer research, but he's not 10 feet in front of it, because they're the ones who kill you. And I'm still here, so thank God for that, and thank you, David. Prince of peace, won't you hear our plea? Ring your bells of peace. That loving never sees. Oh, my love. Every gig I've ever done, I've always felt at home. I don't go out on stage um, to soak up applause. I go out on stage to feel exonerated or to feel um, useful or to feel at work. And I don't... I hate, I hate the idea of um, dying at death. So um, there's lots of little tricks you can use to prevent dying the death. One is by being magnificent. That's my favourite. I never got anywhere because I'm a crip. If I thought that, I mean, now you're going out on stage, I'm getting a little bit of sympathy vote because people know I've got cancer. But if I thought that's why they was clapping, I'd go on. I like to go out and think, be like a tightrope walker. They might be want to see you fall off. You know, that's I can handle that. I don't mind that. The element of danger. But I couldn't really enjoy that if it was just down to sympathy. I would hate that. I come awake. Good for all mankind You're still asleep The gift I seem to mind Rise on this occasion Halfway up your back Sliding down your body Touching your behind you look so self-possessed I won't disturb your rest It's lovely when you're sleeping But wide awake is best Wake up, make love with me If I'd have never had a girlfriend or a nice pair of trousers, 
or a smart haircut, or if I'd have been a good looking bastard, or if I'd have never had a nice job at work, I think I might have had the hump over having polio. But as it was, I've had a very fulfilled life ever since I was a young sprog. Us disabled folk are allowed to say the word crip, and I've met a few noisy crips, but I haven't met any noisy crips who've been cuddled and molly coddled and loved. middle class in the sense that there were lots of books in the house and they were I guess mildly bohemian and slightly genteel um, didn't have to buy their furniture you know, they inherited their furniture my great aunt Janet lived here she was the only one left the walkers and I had all my holidays here from when I was about three just after the war and many many happy times that used to be the dining room. It's where great aunt Janet, <clears throat> she went to Dublin only once in her life to get some false teeth in 1901. The last time I saw her was 1969. And we, and Fanny, the maid, the one who um, was quite severely religiously one minded, she, um, she would come, we'd sit in here, and then Fanny would come out, bong, 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 and ring the gong. And you troop in there, and you have Lucas Aid and uh, cucumber sandwiches. Was there any feeling that your mother had married beneath her when she married your dad? Without uh, Kilcadden connections, there was a feeling of that, for sure. My mum's dad was uh, the brother of Aunt Janet and, and Uncle Arthur. He became a doctor and got out, you know, didn't want to be a farmer. Um, so his my direct, uh, yeah, direct grandfathers and various worthies landed, but really I think a doctor's daughter and a bus driver's son would have been anyway. Yeah, my old man's dad was a bus driver. I think his granddad was a bus driver. When the time when a bus driver was seen for a working boy as a as a really good gig, which it probably was, you know. I mean, my dad was, I know, very proud of his of his skills as a bus driver. And as lately after that, as a chauffeur, he was very. He wasn't thinking it was a, de a demeaning occupation. Although he never let anyone call him Billy. <clears throat> he always had to be Dewey. My old man wore three piece whistles. He was never home for long. Drove a bus for London Transport. He knew where he belonged. Number 18 down to Houston. Double decker move along. Double decker move along. I know he left school at 13. I think he met my mum in a social club in Harrow. He was quite, I think, quite angry about not being educated when he should have been educated. He was very bright, and very aware, and very alert. And I think there was a point where my mum, because she was at university and she had this, you know, middle-class upbringing that she could dig him out with the verbals to the extent that, he'd, you know, he'd lose a plot, he'd get very angry, I think. I think that created quite a little bit of the old tension that existed between them. My dad and my mum split up. It didn't spring off as a natural relationship. This is Essex, though, isn't it exciting? Very. I'm excited. I was conceived in 1942. I grew up near Upminster. Upminster's at the end of the district line, uh, the Green one. And here we are. Yep. Minster. Well, it's been 20 years, 20 years. For at least, yeah. I've been here under the tube since, oh, 30 years, probably. 30 years. Yeah. 
down here, station mode, and we're going to do a left. I think there might be some lights down there. I think it's St Mary's Lane. How are you, Big D? My mum and my auntie lived in the same house. Uh, you could describe them as being early feminists. Three sisters all went to university in the, in the early 30s and late 20s, all got grants, all very bright. I was very lucky to grow up in that environment of being such an open-minded, wide-ranging and very intelligent people, because it rubs off on you, even if you were being Harry the Rebel, it still rubs off on you. My friend Terry's mum said to me, we was in number 21 Gainsborough Road, Dagenham, just making a cup of tea, she went, tell me Ian, are you council? I went, uh, no, I'm uh, a private accommodation, Mrs. is <laughs> I feel slightly guilty about that. <clears throat> July, August in 1949, I think it was a bit of a heat wave. And my mate Barry, who I grew up with in two houses down, and me and his mum went to South End. I mean, he's going to jump on the train half an hour later in South End. This is South End. That's a big wheel. And that's a Palace Hotel. I like South End. I've been here three times this year, usually working. Not uh, paddling or anything. Look at it. <sighs> the pier's very nice. Summertime. And the living is easy. Fish are there's a case of catching crabs over there. There's the old walkway. That is great. And your ma is good looking. So harsh, little baby. No. In 1949, I came down here on a hot August day, and there's some swimming pools up that end, uh, on the other side of the pier. And that's where they reckon the polio was rife. And that's where I call polio. Over the children of Britain, as early summer draws near, a cloud gathers. Poliomyelitis, believe many knowledgeable persons, may reach epidemic proportions. Hence, upon the Ministry of Health, focuses much sharply critical attention. Polio's got an incubation period. So when it appeared with me, I was at my granny's in Cornwall. And I remember sitting down on a couch in the afternoon and then feeling a bit giddy, feeling a bit fluey. Then they diagnosed poliomyelitis, or infantile paralysis. And I was in isolation, I think, for six weeks. My mother was still in Upminster. So they phoned her and said the boy ain't very well and it might be that he ain't going to make it. But I rallied round or whatever. A serious backpacker. Polio attacks your nervous system. So if you get polio on the outside, those muscles there, and these ones here are still working, 
that's what happens. It pulls you like that because the balance is no longer there. So, I mean, it happens on this hand. That one's working and that one ain't. The opposite muscle to do that ain't working. That's why that doesn't hold it like that anymore. <coughs> well, if you go to Africa, you got Nairobi, you see kids with polio, like a bloody lot of corkscrew. It can really pull you out of shape. So what they did with me is put me in a complete uh, plaster body, both legs, both arms and torso, to stop you getting, you know, distorted. I got a transfer down to Braintree, which is in Essex. I remember the wrench of leaving all this behind. I don't know how long I was in, I can't remember. But at least a year, I should think. When you're a kid, you're very open to, you know, whatever's going on. You're with a peer group. You're with other people who are just the same as you, or in different states, or even wherever. And you don't consider them anything different from what's normal. Um, whoever they might be, whatever condition they're in, you only judge them whether they're a nice person or not. Um, and there's some real shockers, and there's some really smashing ones. And sometimes the really smashing ones can't even communicate at all. Then I went to Chaley in 1951. And my auntie said Chaley would be the best place for him to go. And she's an expert in special schools and special needs. I'm sure she was right. The Queen and the two princesses visited the heritage craft schools for crippled children at Chaley. Gifts made by the children were presented to the royal visitors. There are some 350 children. Chaley was basically a good place. It was a trade school, really. And they taught you cobbling, printmaking, or carpentry. It was one of the reasons, you know, you should be a great cobbler's job up until about 15 years ago, and every cobbler you ever saw was disabled because they were trained into being cobblers. Chaley made me strong, physically and mentally. The rule at Chaley was if you fell over, you had to get yourself up. Otherwise, you shouldn't really be there. It took a while to get up sometimes for some people, but you found a way. The spirit of that place was absolutely, there was no despair, there was no, there weren't any suicides, as far as I recall. It was a good place in many ways. It wasn't a good place in terms of educational. My mother thought, well, rather than him being a cobbler, I'd like him to go to grammar school and become a lawyer. So I got accepted for Harwickham Royal Grammar School as a boarder. Couldn't say I was happy there. I was the most miserable I ever was, I think, five years there in that place. I didn't fit in there. I wouldn't have fitted in there if I hadn't had polio. I like to think. God forbid I might have been a bank manager now or something. What did you learn in school today? Jack shit. The minute the teacher turns away. That's it. How many times were you truly intrigued? Not any. Is boredom a symptom of mental fatigue? When have you ever been top of the class? I was 10 years from the age of 7 to the age of 17. 90% of my time was away from home. I'd already got accepted for Walthamstow School of Art by then. I knew that art school was an institution I could subscribe to. Plus, I was at home every night. And really, to me, it was only about being at home. I love it being at home. You can't fill your mother's mystery, occupy another space. You can't do another's duty, or take a special place. So just up here on the right, we'll get there in a minute, it's been, it's had what they call, I think, a granny flat and a garage built beside of it, because it was. There you go. It's now yellow, which is sort of horrendous. There it is. The porch is the same, beautiful, but I've done drawings of that porch. There's me granny, me aunt Betty, me great aunt, various, loads of people, Martin and Lucy, my two cousins. The place was full of people. Hence, he's a, a kind of au pair-ish person. So they got a caravan, a bluebird caravan, 404 quid, I'll never forget that. And I lived in that. We had great fun in the caravan. I had parties and there were 15 people, sometimes a joint was rocking. I had the old wind-up gun phones with me, Charlie Parker and me, Gene Vincent. White face, black shirt, white socks, black shoes, black hair, white straps, head, white fire. We hang 
round to the right, I'll show you where my caravan used to be. If you put on the other side of the road, of course, look, it's all got parking meters, restrictions. Unbelievable. Well, it's great to be long fence. Keep, keep, keep over to the left a bit, though. If it's possible to stop sort of here-ish. No, they built a whole house at the side, look. Just go a little bit further down. I'm put on that side. We'll be OK. Uh, what, the camera? Uh -huh. So in there, my caravan would have been sort of back a bit over there where that squirrel is. And I lived there, I don't know, 14 years, till I went to the Royal College of Art in 1963. And that house there, and that one next to it, that was our garden. That was the orchard. So they built three, one, two, three houses in the garden. That was uh, Pam Price's house there. I want to see Baby Doll with her at, um, at uh, not Pam Price, Pam... God, I can't remember her name. Pam, anyway. Um, we want to see Baby Doll together at the London Pavilion. Eli Wallock and Carol Baker, directed by Elia Kazan, as I recall. This is Endgame Gardens. I had a couple of other friends. Teresa lived down here, a few other buds. My mate, uh, my cousin Martin had a good mate down here. They called each other, both called each other Ned. Well, there we are. That's that mixed up. Fifty-nine, I went to Walthamstow. October sixteenth. I wanted to go to art school because I liked the idea of the Bohemian lifestyle, freedom. I sort of thought I might be a painter one day. It was the way of life that appealed to me. It was the freedom, the style, the glamour of not being normal. I wasn't that good at art. I mean, I, I became good at art by dint of effort, and I learned. And I took it seriously enough, and I got. I loved doing it. I mean, I loved it. Loved drawing. All of us were very, very serious. Pop art. The world of the popular imagination, the world of film stars, the twist, science fiction, pop singers. The first, and I suppose in some senses the leader of the group, is Peter Blake. Blake is 29. He comes from Dartford in Kent, where his father is an electrician. It was the first day of term. Yeah, Wednesday. And, yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday morning. I, I think it was the first, literally the first day I was teaching, and they said, you're... Your group have gone off sketching. Because oh, I was really? late. I was a, oh. always late. Because I had a principal. I wouldn't leave the house before 9.30 really? or something like that. So I was always late. Shh, so, so they sent me to find you all. And on the way to where you were going to be, <laughs> I thought, well, I'll pop into the boozer. And of course, you were in there. I was in there. All that stuff. I forget who you were with. Probably Joe. No, just two of you. Oh, really? Two of you had Could have been Arthur, Stan. cut off from the party. And, and <laughs> rather than saying, come on, chaps, go and do your work, we had a few drinks, then we wandered up there. And then you, you started a landscape. And I, I suppose just some kind of whatever rapport or trust happened because Pretty. of that. I, get, I guess. I mean, that's the way I've always remembered it. I can always remember you had a. I think it was probably from Austin's in Shaftesbury Avenue. Brown herringbone tweed, Ooh. slightly ivy league jacket with a zigzag round the back and a race scene. I remember that. Um, I'm tab collar shirt, the paisley tie. I remember that. <laughs> probably a French trouser. One of the first things we learned from you was to become personally involved with the subject of our paintings rather than just going out and doing some bland old boozer in Leighton or Ooh. something. You said, well, do you actually care? And I, I mean, I remember straight away, you know, you said things, do you like boxing? And mm. it was when Cassius Clay just started up, firing up, and various, you know, interesting wrestlers were around, like Sky mm. High Lee. Our paintings were, our drawings were, you know, fairly representational, but livened up as well. So we're going to do something. We do it with a slightly obsessive air. You know, we, we'd be into it. It was was happening place. Um, we were listening to Jazz Messages and Charlie Mingus and Ornette Coleman and going down Ronnie Scott's and what have you, dressing well. I mean, that couple of years at Walthamstow of getting very, very excited by painting and music and 
and running those dances that we did and getting Tubby Hayes down there, yeah. I'll never forget that. Because we could have had Tubby Hayes or the Beatles. I mean, we could have had the Beatles before we yeah. had the quiz, yeah. Really? But we thought, let's have Tubby Hayes. In I 62. was a big Tubby Hayes, yeah. You're right yeah. at the beginning. Yeah. yeah, I was a big, you know, big Tubby Hayes fan. Yeah. So we got Tubby Hayes quintet for the price of a quartet. So we booked him as a quartet. <laughs> and we got, a, I don't know who it was, a piano player, yeah. presumably. I don't know who it was. But those, that whole sort of mixture between, um, oh, Carnaby Street was kicking in then. And I suppose it was the start of the swinging whatevers, you know. It was, it was they pre the swinging 60s, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, and they were swinging. Yeah. Well, there was this sudden, you know, really interesting, really exciting, um, livened up British art movement. I think that the, the excitement of those days took took us on, um, the, you know, the students. At one time, I think we had about 15 out of 100, or maybe even more, in the painting school, the Royal College, that went to Walthamstow. <laughs> we used to all come down the back stairs, team into handy. the canteen, team handy. <laughs> Woo! Like that. From yeah. that, from walking into that boozer, yeah. we, we've been friends, haven't yeah. we, you know, from yeah. that very first day. Because you came to all the private I went to all of them, you? yeah. All the private yeah. You came to my sister's wedding, didn't you? Down in Brighton. No, I didn't go to that one. I think I missed that one. I met Betty at the Royal College of Art when we got married. She was in the Royal College of Art painting school. A very good painter, much better painter than me. She wasn't at all overt or trendy or anything like that. She was properly proper painter. Did it because she wanted to do it. Didn't do it to be wearing this hat or that hat. She was wonderful. So it was a friendship. It wasn't just, a, you know, it wasn't just a marriage. You could say it was somehow deeper than what you marriages and divorces and all that. But it was stronger than anything you could say, really. She got ill about five and a half years ago with cancer and she, she died. She died too young. We were extremely poor at the time. Well, my dad, he died after waiting for his bus at London Airport for about eight hours in the shitty weather. And he died that night of emphysema. He left me 2,000 quid and me and Betty could then afford to have a baby. He died in March 1968. Well, Jemima was born in January the 4th, so we got weaving straight away, basically. Peter Blake helped me get a couple of gigs as an illustrator. And I could have gone further into that, except I didn't want to. Didn't want to make a living doing that. I let it lapse, and I got a couple of teaching jobs. I was teaching at Canterbury. I was a part-time teacher, so you have a rapport with the students. Um, a wonderful rapper. She can roll a shoulder. And when I started a band, it was using three of the students from Canterbury, um, the Kilburns. Friction very bad, friction double rich. Ian taught me to draw the, uh, um, we did it. Uh, well, it's nice. You showed, you showed me something. And that was good. We, we struck a... You had a car as well, didn't you? A little Morris Minor. I oh, thought Morris we'd get round to that. Yes, everybody eventually came round to that. I was the only one with a car. That was also And it had a dent in the front. I remember Dan Woodside came out and I said I'd give him a lift up to London. And the first thing was he said, oh, that's a bad sign. <laughs> You saw the dent. I had a love-hate relationship with teaching. I kind of got a bit sick of it. And um, I started writing doggerel, and I started doing a band in order to subsidise my paintings to make a living that wasn't teaching. Woke up this morning in a steady shop. I heard a mama rumble and a cocky I saw bands and I thought they were crap, and I thought I could do better in terms of entertainment. But I never thought of myself, well, I still don't think of myself as a, you know, a singer, I think of myself as a performer. And I said to the social secretary, um, if you want a good assessment at Christmas, you put my band on the bottom of the bill to the dance. He goes, yeah, all right.
Well, there was something about our performance. I mean, it was the worst gig and the greatest gig all fun. in one. It was just enough to mean that we couldn't put our guitars gracefully away and go back to our old life, you know. So we had to we had to start. The ball was rolling. Wasn't it not? Was that Sorry. right? <laughs> I always felt extreme confidence about delivering a show, but I never thought about making records at all. Never. Not until I met, really, until I met Charlie Gillett. So I came along to this place which looked entirely different from how it looks now. Yeah. And on stage was a bunch of people who looked as if they might just have met each other at the bus stop outside. This is the thing about bands. When, you, when people form bands, there's a tendency for them to look like each other. They, they dress similarly, they have similar haircuts, and there's just a look. You could see them outside and you'd know that was a band. Yeah. These people, they are playing together and you know they are not a band. <laughs> the man in front, standing on stage, was... I don't know, there's something lurching about his math method of being on stage that made you not, not know what was going on. Right, right. In the interval, because it was those days the same band did two sets. Uh, right. 8 o'clock till quarter to 9, 9 o'clock till quarter to 10, 10 o'clock till 11. Was it, there was an interval. All I remember yeah. was when the interval happened, the band would come off stage, make for the bar, except for one who would stay behind the <coughs> drum kit. Oh, and then at the end of the night, the, drum, the drummer got up with crutches and came off. Right, and you thought, the drummer yeah. has crutches. You know, th these, are, these are radical ideas. I've got to tell you, in 1973, this was bizarre, or 1972, whatever it was. Yeah. I think the thing about the Kilburns was that people couldn't kind of walk past them without thinking, oh, I've got to have another look. You know, and at that point, you know, you've got them. I mean, right. basically, none of us could wait to go out of the pubs. We didn't want to be, the changing room was a lavatory in here. And I remember Lee Thompson, so he used to get in through the window, Lee from Madness. And he used to come in through the window and see me and David trying to change and look smart with a bleeding feet up around ankles in water and the rest of it. So it was difficult circumstances. And getting off stage and coming into the audience, although it's good for your ego, it's not, it doesn't help the show business side of things really, because it, it makes it all kind of... In here there was a lovely guy called Jerry, a Caribbean guy. And he used to sometimes, towards the end of the evening, he used to try and put his head inside the bass drum. I remember that, he used to get right involved with it. And he said, Ian, he said, Gary Sobers was born with a cricket ball in his hand. And you was born singing! And I got silly. <laughs> I really loved him, because he gave me so much encouragement. And I think that the, really the ingredients that kept us going was encouragement. And the later part of the Kilburns, of course, Malcolm McLaren, every gig we did in London, he'd bring the Sex Pistols down. And the very last gig, the Kilburn, Ian Dewey and the Kilburns, it was called by them, the kind of sad end of it, really. But we were headline, headlining, we were, we were last ones on at Walthamstow Assembly Rooms. And second underneath us was the Stranglers, and bottom of the bill was the Sex Pistols. And I stood with Fred, our handler and, and social secretary, uh, one on each side of Malcolm McLaren, whilst watching the Sex Pistols, who had the safety pin, which is a sartorial elegance that I'd inspired myself with, and leaning forwards and growling and holding the microphone in just like I did. And he got Malcolm got me on one side and Fred on the other going, What's all that about it, Malcolm? <laughs> like that he's going <laughs> like that. I'll say if he's copying me, and he <laughs> old Malcolm's <laughs> squeaking away. And ever like since Malcolm's always said he was copying Richard Harris. More so. people have seen the Kilburns since they packed it in than saw them when they were going. Exactly. I've met more people than I could have he could have filled the Albert Hall with them. Oh, fantastic night! I mean, oh, yes! I mean, they, they, they actually, at the time, had a, a legendary status as well. Other bands were scared of us. Other bands paid us a kind of respect. Not a musical respect, or a... but an entertaining an entertainment respect, because of our attitude. band was the end of our marriage, but not because I was out there getting drunk and drugs and groupies, because I was never there, basically. My daughter said there were times when she felt a bit lonely, more so actually when I was being a so-called success, because it was in the papers all the time, whatever, it was, she was aware of my being alive without me being there, so that was more difficult then, I think. Some girl babysat for us once, and that, um, we were all up in my room, was on the front of the house, wasn't it? Yeah. 
and she um, got all her mates lined up outside, was going, why, guess whose house this is? No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're all standing outside. Lovely, yeah. She didn't let them in, that was a, be a blessing. Mm, funny times. I think I used to boast about it quite a lot, about six years old. Yeah. I met some geezer recently who worked at um, Shepherd's Bush Empire. He was a bouncer at Shepherd's Bush Empire. He grabbed me and went, do you remember me? I went, no. He went, oh, I used to live in your, in your area in Ellsbury. And I, I went, oh, right. He said, last time I saw you, you were getting battered by a big load of tall kids down the end of your street. And I, after I pushed him out of the way, he said, thanks, thank you very much. My dad's in Jorini's going to reward you. <laughs> <laughs> and I took you all the way back to, to the house and you answered the door and went, who the fuck are you? And the kids went, oh. That was the end of him. Never saw him since. <laughs> While this is happening, all punk music is exploding all over the country, and I'm getting very, in a way, getting very bitter. Rod, our piano player, suddenly decided he'd had enough, and he went, wandered off into the Mystic. And we're playing in a pub called the Nashville. Bit frustrating, no piano player. And then Ian was wearing a fez, like a Tommy Cooper fez, and I, my whole, most of the gig, my chin was on the flask. Uh, I didn't know what to make of it. It was just like, it was very compelling. <clears throat> It was great, but it was okay. like, I didn't know what to make it, you know. So after, after, the, sh after the gig, I sort of like hypnotised, went onto the stage. And you come up with a piano keyboard smile. <laughs> went, Hello, I went, do I know you, mate? <laughs> That's all I said, I didn't mean to be horrible. Come anymore. on, the rest of it. <laughs> and you went, oh no, I said, well, fuck off then! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Try to change my t-shirt. And I just went, <laughs> oh, look, oh, what do I go now? Me. No, I went, there. I, I went immediately, what have I done? So I said to Spade, listen, I was very rude, that chap who just came in here. See, I think he might be a mate of yours. So Spate went out and found Chaz by the bar and hopefully transmitted my apologies. It was the very first thing I said to you, was yeah, fuck off. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Chaz is a guy that I wrote the, the hits with and uh, still write with. Who'd heard we were looking for a keyboard player. So he just wandered down. And um, we became firm friends. And I just went, do you want to pack up Kilburn in the highways and work with him? He's brilliant. And that's what I did. And just spent a year and a half, nearly two years, writing songs. I didn't want to be a Cockney rock and roller, you know, but I didn't want to be an American anymore. Charlie Goodit, he heard a demo we did that I was singing with an American accent. And uh, he said, what's all that Barry White impersonations? And I felt really... Oh, I felt ashamed of my, you know, my culture. And I went home and rewrote the lyrics to try and make it funny rather than trying to be sexy. And I thought, that's it. Well, we didn't really know about musical things. Ian's a tiny bit older than us, and we didn't know about the cheeky chappy and, you know, <laughs> the sort of vaudeville We just thought he was highly entertaining all around, and it, it seemed to be a very good blend of rock funk with this lyrics from another planet, you know what I mean? I did all that moody Tommy Cooper in order just to pass the time when I wasn't actually doing anything, because um, I always thought Mick Jagger looked a bloody idiot when he was trying to be James Brown. Don't forget that in popular music there are very few personalities. They're mostly kind of drab, soppy little bank clerks who've had a result. Yeah? All right, cool. Yeah, he's ready. All right, let's have you. Okay, chaps, on we go. We came out, I don't know how many, 35, 38 demos. We did a little studio in Wimbledon. And when we got enough, just picked off the ones that seemed to make an album, which was New Boots and Panties. There's a little bit of campness in there, there's a little bit musical in there, in the music. It's not just me. I mean, we had this discussion, Chairs and myself, quite a lot, that I wanted to be English, but I wanted also all our influences to be what they were. So I didn't want to make an English record. I wanted it to sound like the music we liked. Music that made me want to dance. You know, with Jamaican music, African music, American funk, jazz. But I'm quite proud that my sources of lyric writing are what I know about and what I 
to live amongst. Six and cocks and rock and roll. Oh, my brain and body need. Six and cocks and rock and roll. A very good day. Keep the silly ways. Or fade about the wind. Of the wisdom of your ways. Of the bear and all. Now, lots of other ways. What a joy. If all you ever do is business, you don't like. Yeah, it wasn't either really for or against. It was descriptive. It was almost journalism. It was about somebody saying that's what they liked. But when the audience starts singing along with you, you can't tell them to stop. Don't, don't sing. No, that's a duff to them. You can't say don't sing, you know. Audiences are only too willing to enjoy themselves. That's what I found out years ago. And basically, a band is only an excuse, a, a, an outing, a rock and roll outing. What we do is entertainment. It's not holy, and it isn't. It's not a religion, and it isn't deep philosophy. I saw a band in Canterbury. I was sitting there having a drink once, and some little dodgy local band. And a bloke came up to the mic and went, "Here's one by Ron, our rhythm guitar player. It's called Wintry Days." Don't tell them anything. Don't ever tell anybody anything. When you're on stage, you start telling people things. It's just laborious, you know. I was coming here tonight and I had a thought. Oh, you know, we'll keep it. Just, just cause, 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 just cause I ain't never read no nothing worth having, never, ever, never, never, never. I ain't never read no nothing more than it never, ever, never, 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 never. You ain't got the corner to think I won't fall into thinking I ain't too clever. I ain't had it one thing nor another, I don't know there's anything I ever, never read what. did New Boots and Panties that it would do exactly what it did, which is around the world over a period of years, it did about a million. And I never really extended my um, hopes or dreams or ambitions, whatever you want to call it, beyond being able to sell out Hammersmith Odeon. That was the, uh, to me, that was a yardstick. And we did, we sold Hammersmith Odeon in 1978, early 78. I relaxed immediately. So by the summer of 1978, we were 
I don't know about the rest of them, but I was knackered. And then, you know, hey, man, when's your next album coming out? Well, I managed to scuffle about three songs together, one of which was Hit Me With The Rhythm Step. Right now, it's number one time, and yes, he's made it. Ian Dury and the Blockheads. In the deserts of Sudan And the gardens of Japan From Milan to Yucatan Every woman, every man Hit me with your rhythm stick Hit me, hit me Je t'adore, ich liebe dich Hit me, hit me, hit me Hit me with your rhythm stick Hit me slowly, hit me quick Hit me, hit me, hit me Oh, it was great, obviously, to be number one it's just that I was in the papers all the time and um, on the telly quite a lot, and it became uncomfortable being different because I walked differently from most people. Ever since I was young, people would be staring without knowing it half the time. So that continued, but then I got recognised. So I was doubly recognisable, not because people necessarily knew that I walked with a, you know, a, a strange uh, gait, but. Um, they noticed me because of the way I walked, and then they recognised me. And that, yeah, that, I got fed up with being disabled at that point, actually. I was all right if I was with somebody. I could just talk to them and forget about it, but if I was on my own, I got very self-conscious. Then I got very um, uh, nervous about falling over, because I fall over, I used to fall over all the time. I go charging about, I fall over, I swear ever so loud, and I get up again and get weaving. But I got embarrassed about the idea of being recognisable and falling over at the same time. And I read somewhere Paul McCartney said in, when he's walking through Soho, um, he would get recognised and then he'd walk briskly away. Well, that's a straight... If I walk briskly away, I'd be falling over straight away. So <laughs> there was a kind of uh, a moment of discomfort. One, two, three, and Spasticus! 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 Artisticus! Spasticus! 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 Artisticus! Spasticus! 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 Artisticus! Nineteen eighty one was the year of the disabled, which meant nineteen eighty two everyone's gonna be alright. So I thought that's a load of bolo. So I wrote a song. Hello to you out there in normal land. You may not comprehend my tale or understand. Using the word spares always used to get on my tits quite severely. Spaz, they used to spazzy dancing. There was some little girl group used to describe it as spaz dancing. So I thought, well, you know, um, I'll make a band called Spastic and the Autistics, and we'll go around. And my friend Spate, he goes, no, no, Spasticus Autisticus, the freed slave, based on a Kubrick epic, you know. Um, I'm Spartacus. So it started from there, it started with a kiss and developed into the thrusting momentum of... <laughs> I remember when Charlie, a late drummer, started playing it, I said, the bass drum, Charlie, is kind of like, imagine you're nutting somebody every time you play the bass drum. <clears throat> <clears throat> like that. He went, can do. I wrote this a war cry. My awareness within the record of Spasticus wasn't a shared awareness amongst walkie-talkies. So I obviously knew there was a risk that I was going to alienate a lot of people and they were going to get the hump with me. What's this fucking, you know, Spazza doing squeaking? Well, I wasn't moaning. <clears throat> I was actually doing the opposite of moaning. I was yelling. Place your hard earned peanuts in my tin. Everyone's supposed to be very grateful. Thanks for helping me. You know, I'm not going to do this for charity. I don't do that for charity. I don't do charity in that way. If 
I'm doing something charitable, I, I would try and go and just be useful as an observer or if I work for UNICEF, I'll go and look at what's happening out there. I, would, I ain't gonna go and do a gig and give them £20.50, you know what I mean? That's a bloody joke. It was banned, I knew it'd get banned. But it was allowed to be played on the BBC if you had permission after dark, you was allowed to play it. Well, that's the truth. I don't know now, what, after dark? Well, they can't see him no more, or what? You want to go out the toilet, don't you? <coughs> you don't make sense, you know, boy. Come on, shut your mouth. When I was a kid, I wanted to be an actor. But then I met quite a lot of actors, you know. It changed my mind. But, um... So many rock and roll people go into the acting game, none of them can act, and they get a part that's too big for them, and they're terrible actors, all of them. I don't know one, apart from myself, who's quite good. But that's, the only reason I'm good is because I learnt by doing little tiny things and working at Watford Palace Theatre for a month and stuff. This is my domain. I'm in and out here everywhere, all about. I sort of enjoy it. A Saturday mean? afternoon, there's 40 people in there, three old ladies eating crisps in the front row, see Annette Crosby come out and go, oh, no, it's Queen Victoria. And then the top actor in there, like, tsk, tsk, like that, telling them it's sharp. Those sort of aspects. Or, I remember mean, we came out into the in the green room, which we called a bar in normal, um, after the matinee in Watford, and Caroline Langriche says, well, I'm afraid I rather busked it this afternoon. And T.P. McKenna, the, the voice, he went, I have never busked a performance in my life. I went, oh, you fibber. Or things like that. Or afterwards, a bloke in a green velvet suit and a cravat comes up and says, my darling, I laughed till I cried. I went, on your bike, mate, you never. Like that, they go, all oh, crestfallen person. I like the congratulation aspects of acting. I like the fact they really do stroke each other's egos or massage the old neck muscles and all that caper going on all the time. I love all that. It's all bollow, but I love it. When musicians have a blindly gig, they come backstage after and go, like that. They don't say nothing, have a drink, get their sandwiches and go and meet their mum. If you want to join in, it's peace, silence, shake your ass, wiggle your booty, come to my mum to the way. Mash it up, mash it up. Mash it up, mash it up. After a hiatus period of 17 years, we finally came up with a record called Mr. Love Pence. This was a result of about four years of writing songs. If you've got time, you can always get some quality. If you haven't got time, you end up making you know, not very good records, which is what I've been doing for a long time. So we've had some blinding gigs. So it feels generally quite healthy at the moment. He's got his little mortgage and he's got his little lounge, he's got his little bit of equipment to defend. He's got his little telly, he's got his little phone, he wants a bit of Wembley up his pond his end. He's got his little garden, he's got his little shed, he's got his little mower on the grass. He's got his little garage, he's got his little car, he wants a bit of Wembley up his Kyber Pass. Don't call Harry, I will keep King Edward, don't roast him on a spike. I think Harry's a real go and win, let Harry be the spud you like. I went to America to do a part in a movie called The Crow Part Two. And I felt weird out there. Very, I thought it was jet lag. I thought it was a digestive jet lag. And I went to see the quack and he said it probably was, you know, just a bit of a... And then I thought, no, this ain't. So I went back again. And this time he went, <laughs> following day he operated. And that was a tumour in my colon. And that meant that there was a, a chance it could go to the liver. And uh, it would stay clear until about a year last January. And I said, well, the first question that you always ask in the counselling scenario is, how long have I got, Doc? And he said, um, there's no way I can predict that. It probably will be terminal, and it probably will be whatever. Whatever time span I've got, I have no idea. I don't really spend a great deal of time thinking about it. I only get upset when I look at my kids, you know, when I think I might not be there to see them grow up. That does me right up. But as regards, um, Looking after my family, luckily I can do that as well. I've got enough dush to be able to not worry about them staying alive. I'm not anywhere near a millionaire or anything like that, but 
I've got enough. You know, they can survive. Anyway, Sophie's a brilliant sculptress, so she'll make a living anyway. But um, knowing there is that cushion there, that's, that's very good for my spirit. I haven't seen me other two kids grow up, you know. I've had a good crack anyway. Plus the fact that I've had a, a major crack at life, which, you know, more than most people get. So I wouldn't feel like I've been hard done by. A very close friend of mine died about a year and a half, two years ago. A friend of mine who lived in Dagenham. Um, and a Charlie, our drummer, died. My wife Betty died. And um, I've, I've known a lot of people pass away from cancer. And somehow their strength and their, their attitude, their bravery, if it is bravery, their logic, I call it, um, does, you know, it does help you deal with it, it really does. Um, if I was feeling frustrated and unrecognised or unfulfilled or anything like that, I'm sure it'd be much more difficult. But I don't, I don't feel any of that stuff. I feel um, very lucky and very... Um, almost as if I, you know, had a, had a blessed life, really. Because nobody's ever been horrible to me, ever. I don't think, ever. Everyone's been very nice to me, very helpful, very encouraging. Still are. Um, your director general came in his Armani jacket to see us last week. I did. I nearly grasped you up, but I didn't quite. But it's great, you know, when somebody, <clears throat> somebody you, you, you know is is. Um, I don't know. When a mover and a shaker comes around and shakes your hand, it's nice, you know. It makes you feel really good. And um, you know, I've always been a bit of a snob. To be cheerful, part three, verse one. Somebody hurry, they're working, funny, good golly, Miss Molly and Bones. I'm a speak funny, the bow show and funny, jump back in the alley, yeah, no, let go. Are you with the scales, don't look at camels, all other males and equal both. See a pig of Denny, being rather silly, being with my willy and going through. Bit of green and berry, you're welcome with your spirit, come along and share it, oh, yellow socks. Be sure to be healthy, so nothing to be naughty, well, after 40, you know, I'll have drinks, shut up. Bit of Ben Denny. Juice of a cow, a little bit of cloud, anything that rocks. Elvis and Scotty, the does when I was boy, sitting on the potty, curious small cox. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. Reasons to be cheerful, part three. Reasons to be cheerful, one, two, three. I don't worry about it, I don't think about it, I don't think it goes on afterwards, I don't care if I'm immediately forgotten, I don't care if my work floats down the tubes, I don't give a shit. I'm not here to be remembered, I'm here to be alive, you know. Reasons to be cheerful, one, two, three.